může čistě a čistě Tak. Všem. Chceš něco říct? Jedna, dvě, tři. Jedna, dvě, tři. Funguje to? Si to, někam, to nejde slyšet. Tam si nebo jo, připni a i, t- i ten kablík, ať se ho někde nezasupuješ. Kazovátku? Nemám pojetí, ale určitě tam je, já nevím, nevím, který asi to je.
and our next speaker is Martin. Hello, welcome. Uh, my name is Martin Genschur, and uh, I work uh, as a quality engineer at Red Hat. And today I'm going to talk about InfiniSpan, especially about the new features introduced in version 6, but also about some features uh, developed for version 5.3, because I think uh, they are quite important, and community uh, was missing these features for a longer time. Uh, so at the beginning, what, what is InfiniSpan? InfiniSpan is a distributed key value store that uh, holds uh, the da data in memory, but it can also communicate with uh, persistent storage, like for example, file cache store uh, or file system or relational database. Uh, you can access this uh, key value store, this cache, uh, directly from your Java application. Uh, if it's a web application, you can deploy it in an application server and use it there. And you can use it also from a uh, plain Java SE application. But what you can also do is to start a standalone InfiniSpan server and uh, communicate with it remotely over various protocols like Hotrod, Memcache, and over REST. Uh, let me briefly talk about Hotrod because I will mention it uh, a few times throughout the presentation. Uh, some of the new features are related to this protocol. So uh, this is a binary protocol specifically designed for accessing caches uh, on servers. It was developed uh, in JBoss, and it is still under development. Uh, it supports uh, operations like put, get, remove, put if absent, replace with version, and uh, a few more. Uh, it's, uh, it has three levels of intelligence. At the highest level, uh, the Hodot client is uh, aware of the topology of the cluster. So when, whenever a node joins the cluster or leaves it, the client knows about it. Uh, it is also a data distribution aware. So the client knows where the data sits. And uh, if it has a key and it wants a uh, value for it, it knows uh, which, uh, which server to communicate with. This is an advantage uh, over other protocols like memcache uh, or REST, and it uh, results in uh, pretty good performance. Yeah, it has a compact payload, so it's, it's quite fast. Uh, here you can see the, uh, the typical header of, uh, of a request or response. The magic number uh, says whether it's a response or request. Uh, you can specify a cache name. Uh, the last topology, the last known topology, and don't get confused by this. Transactions are not yet uh, supported by Hodrot. This, uh, this will be one of the next features. Uh, yeah, and there is al already a good uh, client developed for Java. Uh, it's pretty easy to use it. Uh, it's quite similar to how you use how you access the cache locally. So. You first create some configuration. You configure to which servers it should connect. Then you uh, create a remote cache manager, pass the configuration there. Uh, you retrieve a cache, and then you can call your operations, put get, and so on. Uh, this client is available in Java, and I will tell you that uh, later that uh, it is also available in C++ currently. Uh, yeah, so. As I said, we have different deployment modes. Like we have standalone server, we have we can access the cache locally, and we also have different clients. So you might be surprised, but uh, until version 5.3, it was not possible to store the data via, for example, Hotrod and read it over REST because they were not compatible. And there was a reason for it because when the compatibility mode, as I will tell you on the next slide. Uh, it's disabled by default. And uh, when it's disabled, the data on the server is stored in the most uh, efficient way for each individual client. So as I said, the Hotrod uh, protocol is a binary one. So when you are sending, for example, a POJO over Hotrod, it will be serialized into a byte array, sent over the wire, and stored directly as a byte array in the server. Uh, 
similar to REST, where uh, it passes a MIME time along, along the data so that uh, we understand the data. Uh, when we enable the compatibility mode, uh, the situation is a bit different. The, the data is stored differently, uh, and it is stored in the way most suitable for reading from li library mode. So now when you send a bojo over hot rod, it will be serialized, sent over the wire, and deserialized and stored as a bojo. Uh, this has a performance uh, impact, because when you want to read it back via hot rod, you need to do additional serialization and deserialization. But this doesn't have any performance impact uh, in library mode because there is no, no change. Uh, yeah, so we have compatibility between different clients and also between different deployment modes. So let's look uh, what the deployment can look like, what the cluster can look like. So we have a, a bunch of InfiniSpan servers and for example, a hot client that communicates with them. Uh, it can store data into the servers. And then we have an embedded in Penispan, embedded in an application, in an application server. And the application can put the data directly into the embedded cache. But what is important is this link, because these uh, nodes are clustered together. Uh, this looks uh, pretty easy uh, to achieve, but the only problem is that these configurations for embedded cache and servers are different. There are different schemas, and it's not always easy to get those configurations equal. Uh, currently, there is no tutorial how to do it. Some of the attributes in the library mode are not available here, and some, some of the attributes here are aggregated in the, in the server mode. So, it's a bit of magic to get those configurations equal. And there is a goal for the next version of, of InfiniSpan to unify the configuration, and it should go towards the server-side one. Uh, yeah. So how can we configure it? It's pretty easy. When we look at the server mode, we just uh, add this tag, enable compatibility, and we can also pass our own marshaller. Uh, when you use, for example, a spy memcache client, which is a specific implementation, it uses its custom marshaller. And in order to understand the data on the server, you need to plug this marshaller in the server so that it can deserialize the data on the server. Uh, this is how we configure it in library mode. It's very easy. It's, it's the programmatic configuration. Uh, so let's look at an example. We are writing a data, well, we are writing a Bojo uh, in embedded mode and trying to read it via REST. Uh, so what we do, create a domain object, we uh, put it in an embedded cache, and then we call some REST methods to retrieve the data back. We can specify in what, which format we want the data to be retrieved. We can get it as a byte array, we can get it as an XML or JSON. Uh, yeah. Well, so this was the compatibility mode. Uh, now let's look at the remote queries. Uh, when I say InfiniSpan query, I mean uh, searching the data grid based on values as opposed to keys. Because you know, uh, when you have a cache, you, you usually know the key, but you, uh, you and you want to get the value back. But sometimes you don't know the keys, and sometimes you don't even care about them. So this is what the InfiniSpan query feature is about. Uh, there is now a new implementation, but the original implementation was uh, uh, based on Apache Lucene, which is a search engine, and Hibernate Search, which provides some annotations for your uh, classes, you define what you want to be indexed because uh, the searching is based on, uh, well, the search, searching uh, is performed on, on uh, indexes. Uh, yeah, but this approach has some limitations. Uh, it is only available in Java and uh, it is only available in library mode. Uh, so there were some new requirements uh, coming uh, from community and some customers. 
so the requ requirements look like this. Uh, it should be possible to do the query remotely. Uh, it should be also possible to do it from other languages than just Java. And it means that the query API needs to be easily implementable in other languages. And there needs to be a common format, this is important, common format for understanding the data between clients and servers. Because on the client side, it doesn't have to be Java. And uh, another requirement was that it should be open for indexless searching. Currently, it's still based on indexes, but uh, in the future, as it is not tightly, tightly coupled to the underlying search index, uh, it can be based, for example, on MapReduce algorithm. Uh, so what was the solution? Uh, developers cho has chosen uh, a protobuf format, which is uh, language and platform neutral encoding from Google. Uh, it's basically a common way for en encoding data for both the client and server. It's efficient, robust. Uh, you basically write a proto file, uh, which I will show you in a minute. You compile it uh, to a proto bin file, which you pass to both client and the server. And this way, that they can communicate and understand the data. And what's also important is that the evolution of schema is possible. Uh, so this is what it looks like. You define your message that you want to transfer between clients and servers. Uh, message called uh, person. You have some fields, which can be either required or optional. Uh, this is important for schema evolution because there are some, some rules how this can, how the schema can evolve. So obviously when you define the field as required, it must be preserved in the next version. So some developers from Google think that uh, it's, uh, it's better to use just the optional and, and repeated uh, uh, types or classifiers. Repeated classifier means that uh, you can have several fields like this. This is an emulation of collections because collections are not available in this format. You can embed your messages in, in some other messages, but uh, for example, inheritance is not allowed. Uh, yeah. Let's move on. Yeah, so you need to configure it somehow on client side and on the server side. Uh, on the client side, what you need to do is to Again, create a configuration builder uh, and pass specific marshaller. This is a class that you will find in, in, in InfiniSpan, producing marshaller, and it knows how to uh, convert the data described by protobuf into pojos and the other way around. Uh, yeah, so then you need to retrieve a serialization context from the remote cache manager and register the protobin file. Uh, yeah. And also what you also need to do is to create your own marshals for each domain object. But this is very easy and uh, uh, I will show you on the next slide that uh, everyone could do that. So this is nothing really uh, difficult. Yeah. So these are the marshals that you need to provide. You just implement uh, three methods. And it's, uh, as usual, it's best to look at examples, look at InfiniSpan, try to look for person marshal, look at it, and use the same approach. You basically describe how to, how to read the fields from the protobuf file and the other way around. Uh, now, server side. Uh, what you need to do on the server side is just to enable indexing. Uh, as I said, this is still based on Index, the searching is based on uh, indexes, uh, but this can be replaced uh, in the future because it's not tightly coupled. Uh, but you also have to register the protobin file on the server. There is a specific component, JMX component, and there is an operation called uh, register proto file. And uh, from now on, uh, both the client and the server understand the data. OK, we have configured the server and the client. Let's do some queries. Uh, yeah. So you retrieve the query factory. Then you build your query. And you call list, which retrieves all the entries that match your query. 
Uh, this is similar to SQL from having and, and other keywords. Uh, and it can be, this, this, uh, this API can be easily implementable in other languages as well. Uh, yeah. So this is, uh, this is how you can retrieve the objects by querying remotely. Uh, yeah. Next feature that was introduced in InfiniSpan in Infinite 6 uh, are rolling upgrades for REST clients. So what is a rolling upgrade? Uh, it's basically a procedure of upgrading the installation without service shutdown. So you might want to uh, upgrade the version of InfiniSpan. You may also want to upgrade hardware. So what does the scenario look like? Let me, let me use the blackboard. So at the beginning, uh, you have some source cluster. These are the nodes in the cluster. You know. and there are some clients that communicate with this cluster over REST. And now, uh, you cannot just, uh, uh, just bring up some other nodes and let them cluster this uh, uh, with other nodes in the cluster and uh, gradually uh, stop these nodes because uh, they are not compatible together. So what you actually need to do is to start a new cluster with the new version of InfiniSpan and uh, gradually redirect all the clients that were communicating with the old server to the new server. And, uh, you know, there is no data currently. So uh, when the REST client communicates with this cluster, there is no link here. So this cluster needs to know how to retrieve the data from the original cluster. So they are connected through a REST interface. And uh, whenever this client requests a key or a value, uh, it can read it from the original cluster. Once all, once all these uh, clients are redirected here, uh, we can issue a, a JMX operation. Uh, we can do it over command line inf interface. Uh, this is, uh, how it is called? Yeah, dump all keys. So all the remaining keys uh, from the server can be dumped into, uh, into one key value pair where the key will be some specific key and uh, there will be mapping between keys and values. And then we have another operation called uh, synchronized data which will be triggered on this cluster and it will load, load this one key value pair into the new cluster. And now we have all the data migrated to the new cluster and we can shut down the, the old one. So this is how the uh, how the rolling upgrade proceeds. Uh, yeah. There are also rolling upgrades for library mode. So there are no clients. Well, uh, you access the cache locally only. And uh, what you have is the target cluster again pointing to the original cluster. But now through CLI, uh, InfiniSpan has a CLI interface, command line interface. Let me show you what it looks like. Uh, you can have, well, let me, let me start a server. So when I start InfiniSpan server, I can access it through command line interface. Wow, that's quick. Yeah. So now I have InfiniSpan server available and I can connect to it through InfiniSpan CLI. Uh, the server is running locally so I don't need to uh, need to pass any any address so I can just call connect localhost and what I can do now is to choose a cache which we, with which I will work. And I can look at some statistics. For example, there is a help that uh, uh, offers some commands. One of the commands is the upgrade. 
And I can, for example, look at the statistics and see that there are actually no, no entries in the server. So this is a command line interface, and it communicates with the, either the server or the library uh, over JMX. And now when we return back to the presentation, uh, the target cluster, when we are performing a rolling upgrade uh, in library mode, is pointing to the source cluster over CLI, basically over JMX. So this way it can again load all the data from the old cluster and at the end shut down, we can shut down the source cluster. Yeah. Another new feature introduced in InfiniSpan 6 is the C++ Hadrod client. Uh, this was quite a big feature, a lot of effort, but there is not much to say about it. This is how you use it. You just use, uh, you just follow the same steps as with the Hadrod client. You create a remote cache manager, remote cache, and then you just put and get your data into the cache. <coughs> Uh, InfiniSpan can be used as a Java caching provider. Uh, Java caching API is uh, described by JSR 107. It has been under development for almost 10 years, and it is still not finished, but it's close to the finish. Uh, the API defined by this uh, specification is very similar to Java Util Map, but it is not the same. It does not extend it. Uh, there are some operations uh, that are basically missing, like size, key set, values, entry set. These are uh, considered expensive operations, and so they are, uh, well, it n might not be easy to implement these operations correctly, and this is one of the reasons why they were excluded from the specification. Uh, let's look at the operations, uh, the comparison we compare concurrent map and uh, the new cache API. Uh, the important thing to notice is that uh, with the new cache API, you always have to decide whether you want to the previous value. Computing the previous value might be expensive in some cases. You might not be interested in that. And so you now need to decide whether you want it. Uh, so with concurrent map, you always get the previous value, even if you are not interested in it. So now you can call put, and you will not retrieve the previous value. The same applies to other operations like remove, replace, and a few more. Uh, this uh, specification covers only uh, standalone caching. It means single node. Uh, but uh, InfiniSpan goes beyond that, and you can pass your own configuration to InfiniSpan with distributed or replicated cache that will uh, make it uh, run in a cluster. Yeah, so the API is quite similar. What you need to do is to use the caching uh, class called get caching provider, get cache manager, and then you create your cache. You can potentially pass your own configuration here, and you get the cache and call the operations as usually. Uh, yeah, so. New persistence API is a new feature, again. Uh, the goal is to, uh, for cache stores to be better aligned with JSR 107. Uh, what is a cache store? It's basically a connection between the cache and a persistence storage. This is how, how we call it in InfiniSpan. So, uh, in JSR 107, there is no mention of transactions in uh, cache, uh, cache stores. So uh, the transactions, uh, so far, they were handled inside the cache store implementation, but now they are handled at the upper layer, so the cache store doesn't have to care about transactions, which also makes it more easy to, uh, to implement such an implementation. Uh, it, it also allows you to... Uh, iterate over entries in the cache store in parallel. This was not, uh, not possible with the previous implementation in InfiniSpan. It has uh, more efficient serialization, deserialization approach. I will show you in a minute. Uh, and there are, well, 
This is, these are the things related to JSR 107, but there is also a slight change in the configuration. Uh, I don't know if it's worth mentioning, but uh, this persistence tag, it was previously loaders, nothing special. Uh, yeah, so we have some new interfaces that, uh, that such a cache store implementation must implement. Uh, let me show you uh, an example. Uh, well, yeah. There are cache loader and cache writer interfaces which uh, provide some basic operations uh, for retrieving single keys, single values. And there are also advanced uh, uh, cache loader and cache writer interfaces that provide uh, uh, bulk operations. Uh, I can show you, well, cache writer interface just uh, has this init method that is called when the loader is uh, initialized, and then you can just uh, write or delete an entry. Uh, cache loader is similar. You just retrieve one and single entry. Uh, the more interesting is, uh, for example, the advanced cache loader, which provides uh, the way to uh, parallel iteration over entries in the cache store. So there is a method where you can pass your, your own executor that provides uh, the threads that will execute cache loader tasks on each individual entry in the, in the cache store. And it can be done in parallel. Uh, yeah. And some other bulk operations like size. Uh, you can implement just some of these interfaces. You don't have to implement all. Then you can have, uh, well, you might not be able to write into the case store, but you, you can just read, or uh, you don't have to uh, iterate over entries in parallel. Uh, yeah, so this was the new persistence API. Uh, another new feature is uh, LevelDB cache store. Uh, what is it actually? It's a fast key value file system based storage from Google. Uh, there are some properties like keys and values are arbitrary byte arrays. There are some operations like uh, put, uh, get, delete. You see it's similar to standard infinite span operations, so it fits well into the design. Uh, but however, it is not a, an SQL database. Uh, there is no relational data model, and uh, you cannot perform any queries. Uh, in InfiniSpan, you can uh, use two implementations. You can use C++ implementation and Java. Uh, if you want to use uh, Java implementation, there is just a different dependency. But the conf configuration is uh, pretty simple. You just add level DB store configuration builder. <clears throat> and you choose locations for uh, non-expired data and for expired data as well. Um, data is stored in multiple files. This is, well, doesn't matter. Uh, yeah, but this, uh, the good thing about this cache store is that it's pretty solid. It's, uh, it's fast and reliable. Uh, it's something that uh, the, the original approach of storing entries into the file system uh, was not. Uh, but let me show you on the next slide that we have already a new file cache store that is able to store data on disk as well. This is just another way. Uh, it replaces the original implementation, which was quite uh, buggy. It was pretty slow. Uh, so there are some differences uh, from the previous implementation. The most important thing is that uh, it keeps all keys in memory uh, together with the position of the values in the file. It means that if you have uh, a lot of keys, a lot of data, and the keys are quite big, you could uh, run out of memory. So in such a case, it's, uh, it's better to use, for example, the level DB cache store, or make sure that your keys are, are pretty small. Uh, yeah. Uh, another new feature is uh, multiple site masters for cross-site replication. Let me talk briefly about 
uh, cross-site replication in general. Uh, so what you can achieve with InfiniSpan is that you can have different data centers. One of them can be, for example, in London. One of them can be in New York. And you can have copies of data in both or all of these data centers. So whenever one data center burns up, you still have your data in the, in the other data centers. Uh, the good thing is that these clusters are quite independent. You can have different number of nodes in these data centers. You can have different strategies for replicating data. Like this one can run in distributed mode where keys, well, copies of keys and values are only on some of the nodes. This one can run, for example, in replicated mode where the copies are the same on all nodes. Uh, also, uh, you can affect the communication between the sites. Uh, so you can uh, specify whether the replication is synchronous, asynchronous, whether there are transactions in use or not. Uh, this is the cross-site replication. But uh, with the original approach, like a few months back, uh, there was a severe limitation. Uh, some customers and some users were complaining that uh, this solution doesn't scale because of one reason, and it was that uh, in each cluster, there was only one node that was elected as a site master, and all the traffic from one side to the other side was going through that single node. And when there was a lot of traffic, it quickly became a bottleneck. So what was introduced in uh, version 6 of InfiniSpan was the possibility to define mi multiple site masters. So this is configured on the uh, Relay uh, protocol. This is a JGroups protocol. And you can configure how many site masters you want at most. And you can also specify which, uh, what they will be. Uh, yeah. So now the traffic can be routed to other sites through all the nodes in the cluster, not just through one node. And this is a, quite a big improvement. Uh, this is actually the last slide that I have. Uh, that's another new feature for Hodrod. Uh, you can have now the communication encrypted. You can create a key store with key tool, which is a tool available in JDK. Uh, a key store basically contains a uh, private key and certificates or certificates for its corresponding public key. So when you pass this key store to both client, like here, key store, and to the server, you can achieve the encrypted communication. And if you also want to authenticate the server or the client, you need to use a trust store. Trust store basically contains uh, certificates uh, from other parties that you trust. And then you can achieve uh, such an authentication. Uh, on the other hand, authorization is still not uh, possible. This is, this is on the development currently. Uh, and it should be available in a few months. Yeah, so we can achieve encryption of the communication and authentication between Hotrod clients and the server. So this was my last slide. Do you have any questions? Okay, everything is clear. <clears throat> so thanks for coming. Nejdřív vypni. <laughs> halo, 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 funguje to? Bylo to slyšet? Jo, já jsem to rád do Martina, neslyšel jsem to. Protože to, ty mikrofony jdou jako to, jo, jo, že tady... Jo, bylo to slyšet, tady ty mikrofony jdou tady. Jo. Uh, máte jeden mikrofon nebo dva? Máme dva. Dva, um, že budeme mám jako dva teďka prezentovat. Tak. Yeah.
Thank you.